I posted a picture of my great grandfather over to Old School Cool a few days ago. I posted it on my main account, not this one. I regret posting it. It's turned my family's lives upside down, opened up possibilities I'd rather not even contemplate, and thrown into question everything I thought I knew. I was scanning some old family photos onto the computer for my mother. I've always been fascinated by my great-grandfather. My mom always has so many stories to tell me about him and how he brightened her childhood. He was truly a remarkable character. Plus, he was a particularly handsome man. I've always loved that photograph of him with his chiseled face and his dark eyes staring into the distance. He wasn't looking directly at the camera. It's the only photograph we have of him. My mom says he was caught off guard by that photograph because he normally never liked having his picture taken. Before I posted the picture, I was pretty certain he'd be a surefire hit with the online crowd. And I was right. But you know, at the same time, I was still surprised by the extent to which people agreed actually with me. The photograph shot up to thousands of upvotes very quickly. My great grandfather was internet famous. I got the usual, oh my goodness, your great grandpa was so handsome. And is your great granddaddy single comments? Also, hey, can we have a picture of you, OP, so we can see how much of the good looks you inherited? The first few comments made me smile and feel oddly proud of my genealogical inheritance. After a while, though, it started to get a bit creepy, as some people started to cross boundaries and they take things too far. I started to feel guilty. Sure, there were some beautiful, respectful comments, discussions, and questions. But as the popularity of the photograph steadily increased, so did its exposure to the world in general. And that was when less than savory characters started coming out of the woodwork. I never knew my great-grandfather, but from everything that I've heard, he was an upright, almost regal sort of man. Well-bred, well-educated, respectable, and dignified. A true gentleman, and he had been greatly loved and revered by my family. And now, that felt like an oxymoron, this clash of worlds. Having my amazing, dignified great-grandfather on display for the ugly underbelly of the internet to ogle and make crude remarks about. It felt like I was violating his memory, like I was literally whoring him out for my own personal gain. And what gain? A few arbitrary internet points? I was about to take down the post when two things happened in fairly quick succession. First, someone kindly offered to colorize the photo and asked for details about hair, eye color, etc. I asked my mother for details. She had been very close to her granddad and she could remember everything very well. The most striking thing about him that you couldn't see from the black and white photo was that he had two different colored eyes, one a deep green and the other dark brown. In the black and white photo, it just looked like there was a shadow over the darker eye. When the colorized version came, it was beautifully done. They got the shades exactly right. That made the whole online sharing experience slightly redeeming, I must say. I showed my mom and it made her cry. I'd almost been afraid to show my mother because she had loved her grandpa greatly, to the extent that she still didn't like to talk about the end of his days. All I know is that it had been an extremely traumatic time for her. She sometimes still tears up if something happens to remind her about the end. Anyway, a few minutes after the colorized version was posted for everyone to see, someone responded. Hey there, I know this is going to sound really weird, but after seeing that colorized photo of your great grandpa, I know a guy who looks exactly like him. Seriously. He comes into my coffee shop almost every day, so I see him a lot. It's like his doppelganger or something. I'm going to take a photo and send it to you tomorrow morning. I swear it's exactly like him. I checked out the poster's history, and it didn't look like he was a troll or anything. I don't know, something about his entire post, history, and the earnest way that he'd written the message made me believe him and feel mildly interested about the promised picture. His enthusiasm seemed genuine, so I was intrigued to see this alleged doppelganger. Most likely, it wouldn't look like my great-grandpa at all, though, I was sure. 
After all, we're often told by friends that they know someone who looks exactly like so-and-so, and when you see the proposed twin later on, it's usually quite disappointing. So, I just reply, Hey, cool. I can't wait to see the photograph of my ancestral twin. Ha ha. And then I soon forgot all about it, basically. The next day, though, I got this message. Hey, so I know I promised a picture, and here it is. Just a quick disclaimer. I was hoping to get a straight head-on shot of the guy. I asked him if I could take his picture, and he asked why, and I tried to briefly explain without sounding too stupid. Basically, I told him that there was a picture on the internet that looked just like him, and I wanted to send his picture to a great-granddaughter of the dude he looked just like. It sounded progressively weirder as I tried to explain it, laugh out loud. It made me realize that things that are perfectly reasonable on the internet can sound so utterly bizarre in real life. Anyways, I don't know why, but he got quite angry and wouldn't let me take his picture. I mean, fair play to him. Not everyone likes their photo taken to be shared on the internet. But I mean, it was weird how his attitude just did a 180. He's always so friendly and nice and he tips really well. I would have expected him to say no nicely, but he was really upset. He was very curt with me. I get the sense now that this will be his last visit here, which is a shame because he seemed like a cool dude before all this. Anyways, so I didn't want to let you down after the build-up yesterday. Plus, the fact that he seemed so annoyed meant that he likely wouldn't come back. And so this was my last chance to get a photo. So, I know this is really iffy, ethic-wise or whatever, but I sneaked a photo anyway, haha. He had to stop at the door. He held the door open for someone coming inside. So I was able to snap a quick pic, but he wasn't looking right at me, which is both why I was able to take the picture, but also why the picture isn't that great. It's a side pose, so maybe you won't be able to see the resemblance as well as if it had been from the front. But seriously, I still think it looks just like your mom's grandpa. I hope you'll agree. Let me know what you think. Given the lengths this poor guy had gone to in order to attain this picture, I was quite amused, so I clicked the photo with neutral expectations. The man was visible in side view, but I had to admit he did bear a passing resemblance to the colorized version of my great-grandfather. Maybe he was a distant relative somehow. It bears noting that the guy who sent the photo was practically on the other side of the world from me, and to my knowledge, I have no relatives in America so this is really unlikely. I thought the doppelganger photo would amuse my mother, who of course had known her grandfather very well. It would be interesting to get her opinion on it, I thought. I took over my laptop to her and showed her the photograph. She glanced at the screen first, absent-mindedly, but then she did a double take. She couldn't take her eyes off the screen. My God, she said, putting her hand to her mouth. She leaned into the screen, peering at it. Can you zoom in on his face? I zoomed in as much as I could without making a pixelated, blurry mess of the face. She stared at it for what seemed like ages. My God, it looks just like him, she said finally. I mean, honestly, just like him. I mean, even. She ran her fingertips over the screen so earnestly and lovingly. Do you see the slight scar there on his cheek near this ear? He used to tell me stories about how he got that, a different story every night. I was so little, I'd sit nestled on his knees and gaze up at that scar, sometimes until I fell asleep. And she gasped and pointed at the scar on the man's hand, which was clutching the cup of coffee. His sleeve was slightly lifted back. There was a trace of a scar protruding from his forearm, extending onto the back of his hand. That one too, that one was so prominent. It was a deeply cut scar. I could feel that one underneath my fingers when I held his hand. It seemed huge to me then, underneath my small hand. He'd tell me stories about that one too. Silly little, little stories to amuse me. Fights that he'd gotten into. Or mythical beasts he'd wrestled. She sighed and smiled, lost in her happy childhood memories for a moment. And then I guessed the bizarreness of the situation hit her. The man holding the coffee in this modern photograph was a young man, and yet 
He had the face and accurate identifying features of my mother's grandfather. She sat down heavily on the chair next to the table. How is this possible, I asked, voicing the obvious question for both of us. Could it be a hoax, she said? Could this man who sent you the picture, could he be playing a trick on you? These internet people can be so clever with with their Photoshop stuff, can't they? Could they have worked from your original photo? Well, yes, maybe, but I trailed off. I mean, it was the only possible explanation I could think of. Anything else would be too bizarre. I brought up the original photograph, the one where my actual great-grandfather was facing towards the camera more head on. The scar near his ear wasn't visible due to the angle of his face. His hand wasn't in view at all either. My mother and I both took in these details wordlessly. She stared at me, her eyes wide. This is impossible, she said. It can't be possible. I sat down next to her. We sat in silence for a while. My blood was ringing in my ears. There had to be some explanation, surely. It had to be a trick or a joke somehow. Or just a really, really weird coincidence? Having said that, the picture wasn't that great quality. You could see the scars once my mother had pointed them out, but not before. So maybe it was like an optical illusion, like one of those hidden pattern type things that aren't really there, but you make yourself see them, and then you can't unsee them. Maybe it was like that, and the scars weren't really there, and we saw them because my mom expected to see them. Because the man's face looked a bit like her granddad, and she made me see them now too. Hey, it could be a prominent vein on his hand, or the lighting or something. And if the lighting had caught it just right. I said all this to my mother, and she nodded along, but I could tell she wasn't convinced. I suppose, she said, but what? It might have something to do with what happened. At, at the end, she was staring at the floor her hands clasped tightly in her lap. Her hands were shaking, and she seemed frightened. What do you mean? I asked carefully. She shook her head. I'm being ridiculous, she said, and she just got up and left. Her whole body was trembling, and I could see tears on her face. You have to understand some backstory, even though admittedly I don't know all that much. Mother has never spoken about those last few days despite my previous careful prodding. All I know is it was a traumatic time when she lost him. It was some sort of violent accident. I know no details beyond that. She still has nightmares about it and was in therapy for some time. I was itching for details when I was little, but I had eventually made peace with the fact that I might never know. Any small details had been like gold dust. She talks about him all the time, his life, his character, passing on his wisdom, but never about those end days, not to me, and never to my dad either, because I've asked him. It's basically restricted territory for our family to discuss. I think, partially because of the mystery around his end days, and what an amazing person she describes him to have been, I've always been so intrigued by this man's presence in our family history, and the bond my mother shared with him, how he had shaped her character. I guess it's because of this general awe and intrigue that I'd scan that old picture into my laptop in the first place, and then why I posted it online, because I wanted to share his essence with the world. So of course, my natural curiosity was on fire when she just walked away like that, so close to telling me more, and clearly in some sort of turmoil. And she thought, whatever it was that happened at the end might be related to this, This modern day man walking around who looked like him? How on earth is that even possible? And what the hell was it that happened? I really wanted to go after her and just open up my flood of questions, but she seemed in that unreachable mood again, like she often did when she was reliving her traumatic memories. I could hear her crying and I didn't want to open any wounds. So I just sat there awkwardly, my nerves a squirming bundle of unease and confusing, and a feeling of fear, I guess. I was trying to process things, but just coming up blank. The modern photo was just a coincidence. We were seeing scars where there was none, and I'd managed to open up a whole can of traumatic worms for my poor mother, probably messing with her mental health. 
I should have known better than to post about this sensitive subject online at all. My mind was made up then to delete the post, and I forgot all about it. I logged into my account, and I had hundreds of new messages. I'd been offline most of the day because my mother and I had been discussing the new photo for quite a while. I opened my inbox with a bit of a sigh, expecting more of the same general comments of jokes and compliments and the occasional lewd remark. Except, what was posted just amplifies my unease by a thousand. I have no idea what to think. I'm terrified now. I think I've opened up a Pandora's box in our family history. Here's what happened. After that guy posted the modern photo of my great-grandfather in the coffee shop, along with the colorized version from the other user, there had been a barrage of comments. Here is just a sample that I copied, pasted, and saved at that time. There were many, many others though, some that I didn't even manage to read. Edit. I've edited out their usernames. Sorry if this messes you up. User 1. Dude! This is going to sound pretty random, but that guy looks just like a mythical figure famous in my hometown. They say he's evil and has a flying beast at his behest that he'll summon if you cross him. The sound of his helper creature screams are enough to kill you. We have an old portrait of him in our town hall. It's basically part of our heritage. They say that many years ago, he and the screaming falcon wiped out half the town's population because they mistreated him. I'm going to post the portrait tomorrow. Same chimera eyes and everything. Freaky. User 2. Hey, User 1, are you from my hometown? I won't post the exact place, but are you in South America? We have exactly the same legend here, except we call him something different. We call him the cunning-eyed one. They say he has two different colored eyes because his flying minion can see through one of his eyes. Anyone he doesn't like, anyone with attitude, the monster flies over immediately. Its screams are enough to paralyze you and pulverize your flesh, just from the sound alone. I used to be so scared whenever I heard screaming during the night. My mother would scare me and my brothers with the cunning eyed mad all the time when we misbehaved. And there are old people here who swear they've had run-ins with him or know someone who has. Everyone thinks he's real. I got thrills when I saw you mention the legend. User 1. I'm not from South America. I'm from a tiny town in Eastern Europe. How scary that you guys basically have the same legend over there. I've never heard anyone else mention this legend other than here in my hometown. User 3. Wow, now that you post those two photos, I have an old book of legends. One of the illustrations is of a handsome dark haired man with two eyes colored. They say he's a cruel monster disguised as a man, uncannily clever. Anyone who fails his test is woken up to the sound of screaming and their screams make their flesh rot and fall off. It's described in so much detail, with historical eyewitnesses and everything. That man looks like the photo here. Sorry, OP, no disrespect to your grandfather, but it looks so much like him. This was an old legend from a small remote Scandinavian village, I think. I can't remember the name they gave to the monster. I'll dig out the book and post more details. The way it was described gave me the creeps. Never heard anyone talk about this before. It was a really obscure legend. User 4. Oh my god, I know what you guys are talking about. We have a similar legend in India, in the village where my parents were from. I am so excited to hear others talking about this. My mother would tell me about something that happened to her aunt when she was little by the cruel one-eyed demon with his helper, the screaming devil. They call him one-eyed because they said he could only see through his dark eye or he closed one eye to look at you through his good eye. I'm going to have to type out the story properly for you. I'm going to get my mother to tell it again. Seriously, me and my cousins loved and hated that story in equal measure. It was so scary, we'd never sleep afterwards. We'd freak each other out by screaming in the middle of the night and scare each other awake. My older cousin did that once and I peed the bed. I was so scared. Too much information, I know. All the elders in our village would tell us about it when I visited back home. 
Oh my God, I am so thrilled that other countries have this same demon guy in their history too. It makes it so much scarier, like he really roamed the world. Wow, I can't wait to tell my cousins. This is like all my childhood excitement fears rushing back. User 5. We have a very similar urban legend in the place where I am from. They say he has the strength of a thousand men and he flies from place to place on the back of his winged screaming monster thing. It had a name, can't remember it. They have different names for it. They say that he had different colored eyes, one evil and one good, and depending on how he felt about you, he would use one or the other to look at you. If he looks at you through the black eye, you're screwed, basically. I also remember something about the screaming. It was my grandfather who would tell us kids stories about him that he heard from his mother. Pretty cool to see it being talked about on here. My family is from a small village in China, but I haven't heard anyone else mention it. I thought the stories died out with my grandfather. User 6. I'm blown away, honestly. I thought this story was just an urban legend confined to my family or something. I had a great uncle who swore he saw this man with unusually uncanny, beautiful eyes that were two different colors. He was almost hypnotized by them. The man, who my great uncle always swore up and down was not a man, but rather a monster of some kind presenting himself like a man, was very strong, and my uncle was very scared. My great uncle was working in a factory on the night shift. This man managed to bend metal with his bare hands or something because he was angry. My uncle was freaked out, and he managed to get away from that place, come home with a high fever. The next morning, the people who were there at his work that night were found literally pulverized. On the phone, I will tape out the whole details later if anyone's interested. Can't believe others are mentioning this same sounding man in other parts of the world that matches up to what my great uncle said. Never really believed it fully until now. User 7. Guys, I had that photo open in my browser and my grandmother walked past. She's visiting us. I'm not lying, I swear. She saw the photos and she did a double take and just froze. She's saying the man's a terrible creature from her childhood. I've never seen her like this before. She was legit scared and asking me where I got the pictures, why I was looking at him. Where were these photos taken? Was this man still alive? Where was he? And she was getting all worked up. She just left our house and she's gone home now, really abruptly. She won't answer my calls. She seemed really upset and shaken. I swear I'm not making this up. Which photo? OP's great gramps or the new pic? User 7. Both. I was comparing them side by side, just out of curiosity. I never expected a reaction like that. I'm really freaked out now. And reading the other replies here, I'm even more freaked out. I'll see if I can get any more info from my grandmother when she calms down. User 8. I feel really sorry for OP. Turns out her great-grandfather looks just like a legendary demon monster guy. User 9. What if OP's grandfather really is this monster guy? Everyone else swears it looks just like him. And it's his likeness that's triggered all this discussion. And on and on. Many legends and lore of a man who apparently looks just like my great-grandfather. With two colored eyes, one green, one dark brown. And different stories, but all sharing very similar elements to the lore that follows this man all around the world. Lots of people saying they heard this legend. These stories around this man, monster, demon. But, here's the worst part. I felt really tired out reading all this stuff. I mean, obviously. I reasoned that they just latched on to the fact that my grand-grandfather just happened to have the same unusually colored eyes as the man in these legends. But with my mother's reaction earlier, I was just feeling bad and overwhelmed, I guess. So I just left the laptop and I went to sleep. There were hundreds of comments I still hadn't read, and I changed my mind and didn't want to delete the discussion just then because there were so many people involved and the whole thing was just buzzing and taking on a life of its own and I felt like I'd be rude to just call it off abruptly when there were so many people so excited. Besides, it wasn't even about my great-grandfather anymore. 
It was just that his multicolored eyes had unearthed a legend that people had thus far just tucked away in their little corners of the world until then. At that point, I was even slightly proud that my photo had managed to bring to light a hidden, very interesting sounding, obscure legend that many cultures seem to have their own version of. I felt I would enjoy the discussion more when I was better rested. I wanted to take another look at the updated discussion in the morning, so I left the laptop in the living room with the page open. Big mistake. I woke up this morning and my mother was sitting by the laptop reading it all. Her face was white as a sheet, honestly. Even on her worst days, she'd never been like that. Even on the days when she'd had nightmares that reminded her of how her beloved grandfather died. Even when she'd been reliving the trauma, I'd never seen her look like she did that morning. I was kicking myself for leaving the laptop open, so I snapped it shut quickly so she couldn't read more. Kind of rude, but I was basically trying to protect her. And I just tried to laugh the whole thing off. She wasn't in a great place mentally because my stupid post had probably awakened further traumatic memories for her about his death. And just, I felt really awful to have pushed her to this point. The discussion about the legend of the two-colored-eyed man was an offshoot and unrelated, so she had no business reading about it in her anxious state. I know, Mom. It's weird how there's a legend about a creepy figure with similar multicolor eyes, I laughed. I guess there must be something in our collective unconscious about people finding chimera eyes scary or something, so they built a legend around that. She stared off into middle distance, her gaze still fixed on the place where I'd closed the laptop. I tried to talk about other things. I rambled on, actually, and she just sat there, transfixed, in shock. I was getting really scared now, so I got her a glass of water. She took it, just absentmindedly, and held it, but didn't drink it. I was feeling terrible. There was goosebumps on my arms. Somehow, reading all that ridiculous, hyped-up, and exaggeration of the lure surrounding a two-colored-eyed man had messed with my poor mom's head. Was she having a mental breakdown? I really was such an awful human being for throwing my family's sensitivities to the mercy of the internet like this. I was wondering whether to take her to the doctor. She put the glass down and got up. She walked into the bathroom and slammed the door. I could hear the sound of her retching. I ran behind her and stood at the door helplessly, crying too now, really seriously feeling like such a terrible person for opening up this whole thing. People on the internet think they can say what they want and run their mouths and create theories and not realize that those careless comments and hysteria can really impact people in real life. How dare I open my family, my poor mother, up to that sort of stuff. She was having therapy for his death. She still had regular nightmares for God's sakes. Why did I ever think this was a good idea? And why had, had I let her be exposed to those horrible, persistent people getting their kicks from relating their stories? When she emerged, she was puffy-eyed and hoarse. I'm so sorry, Mom, I said and hugged her, held her tightly, trying to squeeze away the bad feelings somehow, to protect her from all that bad stuff, to fix her through sheer determined love. I really, really hated seeing her when she has one of her anxiety attacks. It was a constant fear of mine to see her in that broken state when I was little. If you've ever seen a parent in a vulnerable state, you know exactly how awful, how scary, how heartbreaking it is. All that stuff on the internet, it's so stupid. I'm so sorry. It isn't stupid, she said in a small voice. She basically pushed me away. It's what I feared all these years. She was looking at the floor. Okay, so mom, I think we need to go see the doctor this afternoon. I heard the scream, she said, looking at me in the eyes for the first time. I heard the sound of the screams. When I was little, I saw the... She coughed and put a hand to her mouth, and I thought she was going to be sick again, but she wasn't. She swayed a little, but steadied herself. I had no idea about the scale of things. I had no idea he was... I mean, I guessed a little, but, oh God, I was always so afraid to face the fear I always had. I loved him so much. 
I never wanted to face it. She covered her eyes and started sobbing, deep, gut-wrenching sobs, and then she went into her room. She hasn't come out. I really have no idea what to think, how to feel. I can't even concentrate on the newer posts and messages I've received. I've deleted the original post now with its photo and discussion. I just can't handle it. I feel numb, but there's this definite sense of terror too, eating away at the back of my head. I feel so many large, unwieldy thoughts that make no sense, just clanging around in my brain, getting larger, like echoes. But I can't focus on any one coherent thought. None of this makes sense. I just went for a nap and woke up to find a letter from my mother. She's written something for me and I think she's gone out for a walk. I think it contains more info, finally about my great grandfather. I'm going to read it through and will try to update you. I'm really sorry it took me such a long while to update. I'm sure you'll understand why when you know what happened. Things took an unexpected turn. Basically, after my post, I went to sleep and woke up just to find the letter and my mother had gone out. It was quite late, but I figured that she'd gone out to clear her head. I was about to start reading when I realized how very late it was. It was like 2 a.m. My mother must have went out much earlier. She'd been gone for quite some time. It was awfully late for a walk. I just got the sense that something was wrong. I decided to leave the letter and go after her. I paced all the routes she usually walks, but I couldn't find her anywhere. I was running here and there and everywhere. I could think of in the dead of the night, calling her name, getting frantic. I tried calling her on her mobile phone, but there was no reply. It was just awful, absolutely terrifying on top of everything else. The unthinkable things that were running through my head. I'm sure you can imagine. I searched until dawn and eventually called the police to report her missing. It was awful. It was a hollow feeling. I felt their help would be useless. It was just a terrible, bleak, tension-filled day as I waited to hear back. One day turned into two. I began to think I might never see her again. Eventually, well, it was a relief in some ways because she turned up in the hospital, alive, but she was injured. She'd been found in the street unconscious without any identifying information, bruised and bloody. They were able to ID her only when she woke up and told them her name, which is why they phoned me. When she was able to properly speak, she says that she hadn't been paying attention to her surroundings and she'd been violently mugged, her handbag taken. I'll be honest, I don't know what to think. She might be lying. What are the chances that we uncover what we do, and the same day, my mother gets put in the hospital with such serious damage. My mother is insisting that it was really just a case of her being so shaken and disturbed that night that she ended up aimlessly walking into a dangerous situation, much less vigilant than she would normally be, because she was so distracted and upset at that time. I don't know what to think. I'm not going to cross-examine her too much, though. She's too shaken after everything combined. So I'm sure you'll understand why things have been so messed up, that I simply was not able to face the computer to update. I haven't been able to concentrate to properly read her letter fully, actually. It's only now that she's back and safe in bed that I've been able to focus enough to read the letter. And so, I'm finally typing it up for you. Here's the letter she wrote that night before all this happened. Kate, I hardly know where to begin. How can I possibly condense the complex, beguiling character of that man, my grandfather, down to just a few pages? I have so many thoughts, so many memories. I never wanted to burden you with them. Besides, I could never be certain how much it was just my childish mind, my imagination. I suppose now I know. I wish I didn't. How I wish I could have died with the happier memories at the forefront of my mind without having to think about the rest. But I can't pretend any longer. I need to tell you everything I remember. If I don't, it's possible that I might be putting you in danger. Without knowledge, you are blind and potentially vulnerable, and I don't want you in that position. 
There were always signs, I suppose. For one thing, his mind was certainly different. He was so uniquely clever, so wise. Those same things that once made me admire him so much now make me shudder thinking back. He could speak with advanced competence on any number of subjects. And his mental agility, my God, he'd be able to work out complex calculations in a flash. His memory was next to none. He'd read something, and he'd be able to recite it word for word months later, or be able to remember names and faces and conversations with astonishing detail years after a mundane encounter. His charm snared him many friends. He had that ability to make everyone he spoke to feel like they were the most important person in the world. And he doted on me, his only grandchild. I remembered I'd ask him what job he did when he was younger. He'd laugh and tell me something of everything. And he wasn't just worldly wise. He seemed to have this innate sense about people. He seemed to be able to guess my thoughts sometimes. He had an uncanny ability to know what I was thinking. At the time, I used to think it was all just par for the course. All children think so, don't they? When they're little, they think their elders are limitless fountains of knowledge. So when I looked back with an adult's eyes, I really did think I was maybe confusing my memories with my childish over admiration. I could never tell where my memories stopped and where my adoring imagination had colored them a little too much. But I remember one particular memory that stands out. I'd been naughty at school one day. There was a girl in my class. Her name was Sandra. She had gotten a beautiful doll as a present from her uncle who lived abroad. She bought it into class to show it off. International travel wasn't quite so very commonplace as it is today, you have to remember. We'd never seen anything like that doll before. The whole class was clamoring to see it. The doll was a rarity, with gorgeous jet black hair and a darling pretty face and a beautiful intricate dress. My young heart was in love with it and brimming with jealousy. What made matters worse, I hated Sandra. She was mean and pulled my hair and pushed me over during break. She was spoiled and nasty to me. She didn't deserve such a beautiful doll. When everyone was outside, I sneaked in, and my heart beating fast, I took the doll from inside her desk and put it into my bag. The girl didn't realize, and we all went home. I didn't dare risk taking the doll out of my bag to play with, or my parents would recognize the strange toy. But I was elated to have her in my possession, or, at the very least, out of Sandra's possession. As I got home, though, the guilt started to gnaw away at me. At dinner time, my parents didn't say anything, of course. It was business as usual. But Grandfather was visiting us, and he knew. I could just tell he knew. He closed one eye and scrutinized me. He'd always do that when I had something to hide. Look at me through that dark brown eye. I've never seen anyone with irises those particular shades ever other than him, even with other people with chimera eyes or otherwise. One was such an intensely dark brown that it was almost black, and the other was an unusually deep green. When he looked at me like that, it would feel as if he could just see into my soul. He did that a lot, not only with me, he would stop sometimes and squint one-eyed, appraising things. Looking back as an adult, I thought it was just an odd, perhaps endearing habit of his. At that time, though, I spent the entire dinner that evening feeling weighed down by guilt and terror because I could tell by the way he was staring at me that somehow he knew exactly what I'd done. When we were done with dinner, I wasn't able to eat a single bite he took me aside to another room where mom and dad couldn't hear, and he'd asked me what I'd done. First, I tried to lie. I couldn't hide it from him. He started to look angry. I couldn't bear him being angry at me. I finally broke down and told him in tears. I went to get the bag from my room and showed him the doll that wasn't mine. He looked stern and told me to return the doll to the girl. I did. I got to school early and quietly returned the doll to Sandra's desk before anyone realized it was gone. A few weeks later, my grandfather gave me a present, all wrapped up. It was a doll, just like Sandra's, 
except with an even nicer dress, with a note congratulating me for doing the right thing in the end and telling me never to make the same mistake again. I loved him so much for that. He was so sharp, his mind. He never seemed to sleep. He'd be poring over books in his library until the wee hours or going for long midnight walks. To think, he told me, it's a habit I inherited. But he was bodily strong too. I clearly remember he could pick things up easily, like they were nothing. Even when they were too heavy for my father, his son, who was by no means a weak man. I also remember that my father said Grandpa had never been ill a day in his life. His hair was almost all white, but he was still strong in body and mind, and had hardly any wrinkles at all, except for some fine laughter lines around his eyes. I remember just like he was in that photograph. He was always so active and he'd exercise with such rigor, such discipline, and say it was important to keep his muscles active before he wasted away. He always told me it was important to keep healthy and eat right, too. I wonder now if all that healthy living was really just a front so none of us would suspect. He never did get any illness or infection, no matter what we came home with. No cold or flu ever struck him down, even when it had torn through the rest of the household. As it was, we just accepted that his meticulously healthy lifestyle had meant that he'd aged remarkably well and remained so healthy. Faced with such a situation, wouldn't you think the same? All in all, he was such a clever, upstanding, well-loved man. It was easy to overlook those more difficult memories, to forget them entirely even. One day, we went out on a walk. I was staying at his house during the school holidays, as I often did. He took me to the shops. It turned out to be one of the worst days of my childhood. I can't remember the trip itself while it was happening. I didn't know that I would ever have such a sinister reason to recall it. I just remember, though, that partway through, after speaking to someone, he came away angry, so furious. I've never seen him that way. I think there had been a run-in, an argument with someone. I'd been distracted the whole time because I was clutching a chocolate bar I wanted him to buy for me, and I was tugging on his shirt, and then I looked up at him and saw the reason he wasn't paying attention to me. He was so angry he wasn't even seeing me. He ended our outing early. Boy, did I know better than to pester him about that chocolate bar again. I put it down so fast. He took me home, not saying a word. He didn't join us for dinner. I had all but forgotten about it except that I heard him getting up to leave the house in the middle of the night. He often did go for late walks, but somehow the noise he was making, hurried, agitated, just signaled to me that something was wrong. I got up in the dark, padded across the carpet barefoot, clutching my nightgown about me, and met him in the hallway on his way out. He was dressed up in a long, dark coat. He was surprised to see me. He picked me up and kissed my forehead took me back to my bed and tucked me in, told me not to worry. You might hear some strange sounds though, Anna, he said. If you hear the sounds of screaming, put your fingers in your ears and close your eyes. Do you understand? I nodded and he closed my bedroom window, drew the curtains and went out again. I didn't hear anything in that first part of the night, but I didn't sleep a wink. I kept tossing and turning, wondering where he was and what he was doing. Why had he said what he had? Was he okay? Whose screaming did he anticipate? His own? Someone else's? Why wasn't I supposed to listen? I kept my ears strained, but didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. When he came home some hours later, he shut the door gently and made almost no noise on the stairs. He was trying to be quiet, get back into his room undisturbed, but I was wide awake and alert, and my ears were listening for any small sound. My heart leapt when I heard him come in. I'd been so scared that something would happen to him. I clambered off the bed and ran, shivering, to meet him again on the stairs. I had never before seen him as he was that night. The sight knocked the breath out of me. For one thing, he was injured. He was limping and bruised, and his lip was torn. I had never thought that he would have been at the losing end of a fight. He was unnaturally strong. I honestly can't remember any time before that night when I had seen him with any injury whatsoever, never even a scrape. The sight would have made me feel sorry for him. 
but what kept my sympathy choked up was this. The second thing, he looked furiously angry, a determined, savage look in his eyes. Cold, I'm afraid to say, but he looked almost cruel. I ran to him and held up my arms, uncertain what to say, but wanting to reassure him and needing reassurance myself. For the first time in my memory, he didn't hug me. He barely looked at me. I reached out to him, but he avoided my touch, irritated, something else he'd never done before. I went back to bed desolate, so upset that my dear grandfather was hurt, but I felt wounded that he'd ignored me and treated me so coldly, so incredibly unlike his normal self. I cried myself to sleep, wallowing in self-pity and confusion. My tears had exhausted me, and I was almost asleep when the sound of the first scream came. I don't think I'll ever be able to convey to you, Katie, what a sound that was. It was like any human sound I have ever heard. The very sound of it filled me with such a deep, intense terror that I forgot all my thoughts. Everything was knocked out of my head. It felt like I did not exist anymore. It felt like I was just a body filled with fear. The sound seemed to evoke something primal in me, a fear so intense I never thought possible, a fear so deep it physically hurt. I could barely breathe, I could barely move, and I was soaked in sweat, and my bed sheets clung to my clammy body, but somehow I managed to drag the covers over my head. That's when the next scream came. That's when I remember what Grandpa had said, and I put my fingers in my ears so tightly that my ear canals ached. Whatever it was that was making that sound, I didn't even want to think about it. I screwed my eyes shut and crawled up my knees to my face. I didn't sleep. Every time I got close to dozing, I jerked awake because I was afraid my hands would become loose and fall away from my ears. I couldn't risk that. The next morning, Grandpa came down. He said nothing, still looking stern. But what was even more unsettling, his injuries were all gone. I remember staring at him astonished, but he said nothing, nor did he look at me. He just went back to his books after breakfast. I suppose I must have imagined everything, except a few days later there was an unexplained death. A man was found with unusual injuries. They said he seemed to have been pulverized somehow, except they couldn't explain it. The work didn't seem like anything a human could do. They suspected perhaps some extreme disease. They'd identified him only by his dental records. I remember looking at the photo in the paper. I was certain I'd seen him in the shop that day. I was too afraid to ask Grandpa about it. The news died out in a few days, and I suppose so did my memory. As he returned to normal, my loving, clever, kind Grandpa, I forgot all about it. The second time I heard the screams was a few years later. I was about 10 years old. That time, it wasn't just one night, but three nights in a row, and it all came back. I did as he told me that first time and put my fingers in my ears. In the mornings, it would feel as though nothing had happened. But then came the news that there was a young man missing from our neighborhood. Worry seemed to gnaw at me. I don't think I would ever have linked the two things together, except for the fact that I noticed Grandpa seemed uneasy whenever my parents discussed the missing man or saw an article about him, or any time anyone expressed any concern about the case. Again, my mind made excuses. It was a coincidence. I resolutely ignored it. Some days later, I read in the newspaper that the missing man was found, alive thankfully, but with puzzling injuries, internal hemorrhaging. He was ranting and raving about a large black terrifying wind creature and screams that had almost torn up his body. As soon as I read that, I looked at my grandfather. We were sitting at opposite ends of the dinner table while I read the newspaper over dinner. His eyes met mine, those uncanny wise Chimera eyes, and for once it was me reading his wrongdoings, and through that strange dark eye of his he could read me. He knew that I knew. But as the years wore on, I don't know, when it's all written out together like this, it seems undeniably terrible, ominous. But when these events are like rare blips, with long stretches of unremarkable, completely normal days all the rest of the time, it's so easy to forget. 
it's easy to cajole yourself into disbelief. You have to understand, I didn't have the collective knowledge of the internet. I knew nothing about those terrible legends, the lore. All I knew was what I had seen and heard, the dead of the night. I had only disjointed evidence at best. I knew nothing about where the screams originated. I had no direct evidence that my grandfather was involved at all, only that he had given me that singular warning. My parents knew nothing of what had been going on. The only person who knew was my grandfather, and he gave no indication that anything it was wrong, so it was difficult for me to believe otherwise. When the days went back to normal, those memories felt only like vague nightmares, less and less vivid and less believable with the passage of time. Besides, when you love someone, you make excuses. You want to push things under the rug. You don't want to face the truth. When you're little, you doubt you even know the truth. The years matured me, and I became certain that my infant brain had been over-sensationalizing things. How could my grandfather, with his upright moral character, his kindness, his wisdom, how could he be connected with anything sinister? As I approached my middle teens, Grandfather started to talk more and more about how he wouldn't be around forever. He laid it on thick with the life advice. More conversations revolved around what to do when he wasn't around anymore. It made my heart so sad to hear him speak like that. I'd tell him he was fit as a fiddle, that he shouldn't be so pessimistic. He was healthier than my father, his own son. He would wave my protest aside and tell me to be serious. He would talk to me about my life plans. He would tell me about things to be wary of. He would tell me that I needed to be careful, make wise decisions. But then I noticed he steadily began to deteriorate. My brave, strong grandfather. He would stop and look around with that dark eye of his, and he'd start. Sometimes he would lose track of conversations, distracted. He started crying out in the night. My father suspected dementia or some other mental illness. We'd never seen him so distracted, so confused before. Combined with his incessant talk of his death, I finally began to get concerned. We mentioned getting him examined at a doctor, but he resolutely refused. It went on for some time. We were scheduled to go on a family holiday, my parents and I. Grandfather never came with us on our trips, but I didn't want to leave him. So my parents left without me and I stayed with him. And that's when it happened. One night in particular, I could hear him pacing, rummaging around in his study. I laid awake and wondered. His eyes roamed, always distracted, and didn't focus on my conversation. I couldn't get rid of the awful feeling that he wasn't losing his mind. It was much worse, much more sinister. He was confused and vulnerable because, for the first time in his life, he was distracted, because he was finally afraid of something. I think I found this thought worse than anything else. I thought about it all night long. For some reason, it was all coming back to me, those suppressed thoughts, the memories of the screams, the body, the missing man, my grandfather's uncanny sharpness, his charm, his knowledge, his strength and perception. It wasn't natural. Why was he like this? What was he? Was everything catching up to him now? Was that why he was afraid? I drifted into an uneasy slumber, and that was when I had the nightmare. I dreamt that I heard something from grandfather's study. In my dream, I rose from my bed and went towards the study. The lights wouldn't turn on, so I just crept down the stairs and through the hall in the darkness. I was shivering because the heating wasn't on. It was winter and it was cold. Was there a power outage? I reached the corridor leading to the study and stopped. There was a dark figure standing in the corridor, facing away from me. A man in a coat with a hood up over his head. Grandpa, I said. The figure turned around. His face was obscured in the darkness. So, you're his granddaughter, he said, turning around. He spoke in a low but clear voice rasping slightly. I would never have taken that creature for a family man. I took a step back and wanted to run away, but seemed frozen. Look what your grandfather did to me. He lowered his hood. It was a terrible face, withered, melted features. He looked like a walking corpse. 
I think I might have screamed or gasped. My grandfather emerged from the door behind him, from the study. The man in the coat took a step forward and grabbed me, pulled me to him and turned around so we were both facing my grandfather. My back was to this man corpse and his its arm was around me, pulling me into his chest. Every villain has its weakness then, said the man corpse, speaking evenly, even wicked monsters such as yourself. I was crying silently. Let us see you call your helper. Call him upon me again to finish the job. It'll kill you or not to. I felt his chest heave behind me against my back as he laughed, a humorous laugh. After all, you have no hesitation killing the children of others. Grandfather was looking at me, his mouth set into a hard line. He made a sudden move and wrenched me away from the man. He pushed me away. I fell bodily to the floor, winded. Run, he said. He was distracted in saving me. I heard a gunshot. I saw Grandpa fall to the floor. I heard the man laughing, and then I fainted. I woke up in my own bed. It was daytime. Sunlight was pouring through the window. It was a cold, clear day. It took me a while to remember everything, but when I did, God, can you imagine my relief to learn that it was all a dream? I rushed from my bed, my feet getting tangled up in my sheets. When I managed to untangle myself, I ran to the study downstairs, and my heart sank when I saw the door was open. His books and papers were disheveled and strewn about. There was blood everywhere. I think for some time I just lost my mind. I wasn't able to follow or even provide any lucid evidence for the police investigation that followed. I just knew it was pointless. I didn't know what to believe. After all these years, I couldn't understand if it had been a dream or not. All these years, I was so confused. If it hadn't been a dream, if the dream had just been the product of me hearing sounds in the night, then he would still be dead and gone. He had been so uncharacteristically nervous those last few days. If it hadn't been a dream, I had seen him die. I had caused him to die, and he died a villain. Over the years, my love for him overwhelmed me once again. I was able to reason with myself that those things I'd seen were just my imagination. The screams were just coincidence, someone drunk, screaming in the street perhaps, and I'd exaggerated the sound in my mind later on. Wild, nonsensical stuff made up by my child's brain. It was all ridiculous, beyond ridiculous. That last night had been a dream, caused by the violent noises of a robbery that killed my grandfather, as the police hypothesized. They'd ransacked the house. Much of my grandfather's things were missing and gotten rid of his body. The therapist validated my reason. I learned to love and admire my grandfather again, just that I had known him, outside of those terrible nights. Today, that was all destroyed. Never, 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 even in my wildest, most frightened thoughts, had I imagined the sheer scale of it. Never had I thought that he might be alive still. Even if I had tentatively thought that there was a chance that he escaped that night alive, I didn't think he would still be alive today, so many years later. Never. I knew he was unnaturally healthy for his age, but that he's been around and feared for centuries, God, the thought of it. I knew him as loving, but the world around him did not. And I suppose I caught glimpses of that other perspective. And I know now, I knew only a small fraction of his life, of his character. I don't blame you, my darling, for uncovering all this. It pains me, yes, but we must face up to the truth, no matter how sinister, how terrible it is. So, there it is. That was the end of my mother's letter. You know, I think I'm going to try and research to find out everything I can about him now, all the lure surrounding him. Seeing my mother in hospital, I'll admit it was a frightening shock. I still don't know what happened or the true extent of things, and I have no idea what this man is capable of. He seems to have that dark undercurrent that was much larger and much darker than my mother had ever known. But I do think it is better for us to be armed with knowledge than blindly wandering in the dark. If anyone saw the original post on Old School Cool and commented there with their experiences or legends about him from your area, 
I'd appreciate it if you could share with me anything you know via PM. I'm going to try and find out everything. I have no idea what I'm doing or where to begin. I can barely gather my thoughts or make up my mind what to believe or how to think or interpret things. It's so confusing and so ominous, all of it. I don't know where it will take me, but I have to do something. I'll try and compile all I find out and keep you updated.